Good to go. All right. So, quick update from the Elixir Core team. We do this. Uh, uh, every conference the second day after the first day there's an update from the Erlang core team. Um, I gave the very similar talk um, a few months ago, it could be Europe, so we have, we have, but we have a few updates. Um, so I'm Andrea, I'm a member of the Elixir core team, uh, I've been a member for uh, six years now, and uh, now I work at Apple uh, on the supply chain organization for, for zero uh, carbon emissions and, and all of this stuff with Elixir. Um, all right, so a recap of Elixir releases released every six months, roughly, uh, when, when we managed to do it. Um, and uh, we always release non-breaking versions, meaning that uh, one, like, so using semantic versioning, we always stay on the one uh, major version. We only release minor versions, so we're compatible with, uh, backwards compatible with uh, code. Um, the last, the re release uh, before this one was 113, and just to recap what was in there, so this was released um, in uh, December 2021, so almost a year ago now. Uh, very focused on developer experience. Major features there were semantic rec recompilation, uh, meaning just smarter recompilation to make um, recompiling projects a little bit uh, faster, mostly uh, by recompiling less stuff. Uh, a bunch of improvements to mix XREF, which is a tool to kind of see dependencies between modules uh, um, at compilation time, like compile time dependencies and, and graphs and stuff like that for your code base. Um, we introduced code.fragment, which is a module that you can use to essentially do stuff like uh, formatting uh, and uh, uh, auto completion. So it just gives you, uh, gives tools to, uh, to tool developers. Uh, to, to operate on incomplete Elixir code. So you can do something like, uh, you know, open, like, uh, module name dot, and then you, you have, uh, you can go to auto-completion um, a little bit better. It's a little bit easier to do stuff like that. Um, and then we introduced formatter plugins. So Elixir has had uh, its uh, uh, code formatter for, for a long time now. Um, in 1.13, we introduced um, formatter plugins, which means that you can do something like, um, you can define your own module that's a, that's a uh, formatter, and you can say, okay, this takes care of the, I don't know, these sigils and these file extensions, and then there's a function that you can use to format code, um, and you can just list it in your formatter.exs configuration, and it lets you do stuff like, um, for example, formatting uh, HEX um, templates over here. You can see this in action. Um, so they, they implemented this for, for live view and stuff. Um, so this, this lets us do like nice stuff for um, like extensible formatting. The latest release was 1.14, um, which was released in September 2022. Uh, we bumped the requirement to OTP 23, so we're, we're keeping, keeping it recent. Um, as you can tell, December 2021 and September 2022, it's not six months, but we're, we're doing our best. And um, so the, the, one of the biggest features in uh, September 20, uh, sorry, in uh, 1.14 was uh, DBG. So still focused on uh, developer experience. DBG is something that's, that a bunch of other languages have at this point, but it's a, a macro that lets you kind of print code nicely. Uh, that's, that's the main thing. So imagine that, for example, in uh, this, this is the content of my dbg.exs file. I have a file where this is, this is the contents. Um, if I run this file, um, it's going to have a nice, dbg is going to print it nicely. Um, instead of, it's essentially io.inspect on steroids, right? So when you see, uh, when I run this, it prints the location of, uh, of the call, it prints the expression that I'm printing, and then it prints the value on the right. So we've, we've all been using, I think, io.inspect for this for a very long time. Then we added label to it to make it a little bit more uh, uh, useful so you can label values that you're inspecting. And the DBG is kind of the evolution of that. It lets you like uh, print um, you just write dbg on an expression and it prints a bunch of information about that expression. Uh, we can do this because this is a, a macro so it, it understands Elixir code. Um, to show how it under, actually understands Elixir code, um, we made this work, for example, with uh, pipes as well. So imagine that you have this pipeline where you take some value, you do some transformations on it. Um, if you add, should go, should have dbg come up. You know, like that. If you if you <laughs> if you add dbg to to the end of this pipeline, when you run this file, um, dbg is going to be smart enough to be able to print every value of the pipeline. Um, so we can see this in action. I run uh, dbg pipe 
pipes .exs, um, and it prints every value of the pipeline. You see, like every step, it prints the value of that step of the pipeline, but just putting the BG um, at the end, or wherever you put it, it's gonna print up to that point. Um, so it kind of understands Elixir code and it's able to do all this stuff. Um, it also does prying in IEX. So IEX pry, I don't know if you've ever used it, but it's essentially breakpoints. Um, you can say, you can put a pry call anywhere, and then when you run your code with IEX, you can have a shell open at the point in your code. Um, if you run um, code that has DBG calls in, in, in it uh, through IEX, uh, uh, DBG is going to set up now a pry breakpoint for you uh, so that you can do um, things like this, where I run the same file as before, pipes.exs, but I run it with EEX instead of with Elixir. Um, and it's going to tell me, like, do you want to pry? This is a request to pry. I say yes. And then I actually have a um, pry session here where I can say, where am I? And everything that you know about pry works. I can step through the, um, the pipe over there, and I can see the values uh, just one, one uh, call at a time. So it lets us do a little bit more, um, a little bit nicer inspection there. And um, DBG is built on top of customizable backends. So for example, uh, the one that you saw where it printed stuff, that was the default backend. IEX sets its own backend, and then this is extensible to anyone that wants to write one. So for example, um, uh, the Livebook um, people have been writing a, a backend for DBG that lets you do the same thing with pipes. I just stole this out of their blog post. Um, but essentially, you can do the same fancy stuff with pipes in, uh, uh, in uh, Livebook. So you can like move stuff around, you can turn off and turn on uh, expressions, you can like step through it manually, so it's quite, uh, it's quite nice, and it lets us do this sort of stuff um, through customizable backends. So that's, uh, that's DBG. Um, then we got uh, Partition Supervisor in Elixir 114. So this is a way to solve the kind of process bottlenecks in your application where when, the, the, um, when a single process, like a, a single tone process, becomes a bottleneck. So imagine that you have your application supervisor and then you have a single process. Could be anything that, uh, like a cache or, or, or whatever you're using to keep some state. Um, so just, just any single process. When this becomes a problem and the process is parallelizable, so it's uh, partitionable, for example, uh, it could be like a registry, it could be a, you know, uh, the owner of an ETS table or anything like that, uh, then we can, you can use partition supervisor to essentially create multiple copies of the process and supervise them under the, the same supervisor. So uh, the partition supervisor, imagine that you have, for example, that your bottleneck process is an error reporter process. So it's a process that's connected to some service, like, I don't know, Sentry or, or Rollbar or whatever, um, and it reports errors, right? And at some point, this, pro this process can become a bottleneck if a lot of other processes are reporting errors through it. Uh, so what you can do there is you can put it under a partition supervisor. So here you see that the partition supervisor becomes the, the child, and then it's it supervising error reporter processes um, so that it can supervise more than one. Um, and then you could have, instead of calling the uh, error reporter process directly, you go through the partition supervisor. So partition supervisor supports uh, via tu uh, tuples so that you can, it essentially figures out uh, like par um, partitions th uh, through the, um, across the process that it's supervising um, to give you a different process. Um, so it kind of like solves the, the use case where you have, for example, a single registry in your application is a common use case or uh, anything like that that you want to partition and supervise. Uh, then we have uh, in 114 slicing with steps. This is a very, very tiny thing, but uh, we introduced these a while ago, which are ranged, uh, step to ranges, sorry. Um, so that's a range where the step is two instead of the default one. It's always been one. Um, by default, and this now, now you can specify. Uh, we released this a while ago, but we never used it for any APIs. And this is the first release that actually introduces something uh, that uses it. So for example, enum slice now can slice with a range that actually takes a step. So instead of taking uh, the first to the fourth element, now it takes the first to the fourth element, but uh, stepped every two elements. So just, just a very minor thing, but we're starting to use this API. And then something that I personally really, really love is uh, ex that we introduced is expression-based inspection. Um, this means that uh, before, 
uh, Elixir 114, we had something like where, where um, this, this sort of syntax where you have like um, pound sign version or pound sign uh, map set uh, and stuff like this where you would have this, uh, this, this um, syntax for inspected terms. Uh, the problem with this, as you probably all know, is that if I copy and paste it, it's a comment, so it's, not a, it's not an expression. Um, and that's fine for things like uh, PIDs or ports that you, I can't really reproduce, uh, but it's not really nice for data structures, right? Like a version is just a data structure. So what we're doing now is that for a bunch of data structures where we can, we use the actual, uh, rep the act an actual function call that recreates the same structure as the inspected representation. So now if I call version.parse, it will return OK and the version. And if I inspect it, 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 the version is inspected as a call to version.parse bang, which returns the version itself, basically, so that I can just copy and paste this code and it's going to give me the original, uh, the original um, data structure. So this is uh, implemented for version, for version requirement, for map set, for, for date.range, so a bunch of data structures that, uh, that uh, we can use. And uh, it can be implemented for decimal, for example, is implementing it. Um, as a library, so it's just implementable by, um, it's just a convention really, it's not, it's not really any, any new feature. Um, and it's inspired by, for example, Python has this, uh, when you implement underscore underscore wrapper, that's, that's meant to be something that can then be evaluated to get the original uh, value back. And last but not least, we have improved errors in binary construction which is something that really Erlang did, not really us, but we get it uh, for free by using Erlang underneath. Uh, so this, this came out in OTP 25, and um, it means that now, before, what you would do is something like try to concatenate an integer in a binary, you would get a really hard to understand error, it's just argument error, and then you would have to go figure out what's wrong, and now instead, uh, this is what happens, it says actually, it gives you a lot more information, it says like it failed because uh, the first part is an integer, the, 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 the first part is not a binary, the second part is a binary, um, so it gives you a little bit more information to, to work with. Uh, again, thanks to Erlang, because we didn't really do much. Um, we don't really have any um, things set uh, yet for Elixir 115. For now, we're just working on the, like, kind of planning it out. We just released 114, so we, we, we're not really sure. Um, we announced that we are working on uh, set theoretic types, for the long term, they're not going to be out in 115, but that's that's something that the team is focusing on. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all. If you want more information, website, and that's my handle. We've got time for a few questions. Anyone? There you go. That's one. <laughs> so, they won't hear you online. Uh, with, with the DBG, does that return the value it received the yes. way IO inspect does? Yes, you yes. put it in the middle of a pipe, awesome. Yeah, 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 good question, yes, yes, the answer is yes. So it, it behaves like, a, it, it prints a value and returns it like a IO inspect. So you can just put it around code essentially and it works the same way, just with a lot more Nice sprinkles. Another question over there. Okay. We've got, let's take the one online in the meantime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why is Elixir so awesome? I don't know. We, we, we do our worst, but it still is. <laughs> is there a way to turn off the prying on DBG? Yes. Yes, that's a good, good question. Yes, there is a way. Uh, I do not remember how because it's been a while since the last time, yeah, yeah. but, but uh, yeah, I think you do, like we, we now support something like maybe dash dash no pry when you, when you do IEX, um, so you would like do IEX dash dash no pry and uh, it, it would not uh, pop up. To DBG? No, but we could probably, that's probably something we could, uh, we could do. We just generally, like DBG is something you use and you don't really, um, keeping the code, so the less you type, the better. So we like you try to just type dpg and then and then like say something and then you take it away usually, right? So, but that's probably something we can uh, we can add to dpg, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Um, I think I missed when you were telling us a little bit about partition supervisor, but could yeah. you talk a little bit more about when you would want to see people reach for that? Yeah, uh, sure, let's uh, go to the nice picture, this one. 
Uh, yeah, so, so uh, you would use partition supervisor essentially anytime you have a process in your application that's a singleton process. So it's, it's a single process doing something and used by the whole application. And um, you want to, that process is easily partitionable. So it's easily like, for example, parallelizable. And the example that I made is this, like it could be this error reporter process, it could be, um, the, the example that the Elixir documentation uses is, is registry, right? You have a registry that's like keeping track of, uh, um, I don't know, like where processes are registered, and that registry itself can become a bottleneck at some point, right? If you have a lot of uh, stuff talking to it, if it's just a single registry in your application, it doesn't really scale. Um, and the, the idea with the partition supervisor is that you can have a super, you, you can kind of like make copies of that same, uh, the same process, and partition supervisor, uh, using that uh, via tuple, it's actually going to route based on the, so for example here it says reporter self, what partition, the reporters is the name, but self is the term that partition supervisor here is going to use to hash and to figure out in what partition to, like what, what process to uh, route to, so that the, you would have like a, you hopefully like a kind of like a, a uniform distribution over this process. So the case is whenever you have a, bottleneck, a process, a singleton process that the whole application is using to do something, um, and it doesn't really scale up, uh, and you want to parallelize it and like make more copies of it. Partition supervisor is going to help you with supervising as well as routing to, to the process, like doing, doing the partitioning and routing to the processes. Okay. One over there, I think, in the back, super In back. the back, yep. Um, given that you said it helps with the routing for your given partitions, can you speak to how customizable that is? The reason I ask is like maybe I want to shard a registry over different processes and I don't mm -hmm. want to have the same copy of the data. How intelligent is the routing for the partition supervisor? Um, I'm, I think you can, I can't remember, uh, but I think y you can either pass something over here, uh, like uh, the hashing function uh, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, this is meant to be kind of like a simple way to shard, to, to like shard, like partition uh, over a, a bunch of processes, right? If you need like very custom logic or like a very, um, not really custom, like a routing is, is like you, you can customize the function that's used for routing, right? Like the, the hashing. Uh, but if you want uh, like something more complex, you would kind of like reach for something else probably, right? This is just a simple way to take, it's like a, it's supposed to be like an easy to access tool in the standard library to take something like registry, um, you know, and make it, uh, yeah, and like kind of like parallelize it a little bit so that it doesn't become a single bottleneck, right? Yeah. For more complex use cases, you, you might want to like write something else, or like reach out for something else, right? Yeah. Okay, great. So it's, right. Thank you, Andrea.